what's up, everybody? Steve Schwartz here from LSAT Unplugged, joining you today to share my conversation with Anna Ivey. Anna is the former UChicago Law Dean of Admissions and the founder of Ivy Consulting, a law school admissions consulting firm. I hope you enjoy our conversation regarding the U.S. News Law School rankings this year. Before I get into it, a little bit about LSAT Unplugged. We offer live online classes via Zoom, on-demand video courses, small group coaching, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Check out the links below this video to find out more and to book a call with me and my team. We'd love to help you out. I'd love to focus this conversation with you today around all the U.S. news rankings craziness. I thought today was going to be the release day. It's not the release day, obviously. So it's an I interesting just, year. <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting year. So um, I'd love to just you know get your thoughts on the different elements of of what's been going on, tracing it all the way back to Yale and Harvard, quote unquote, boycotting. And then from there up, up through where we are right now with the re release of the rankings now postponed by one week. Does that sound like a, a good plan? Absolutely. And, you know, my philosophy is always that I try to teach people or help people think like admissions officers and understand it from that perspective. Because ultimately, that's if you're an applicant, that is the perspective that ultimately matters, right, mm -hmm. um, is, is the people who are going to be making that that decision. And so sort of understanding all of that and how that all fits together from the admissions side, I think, might be one way for people to think about the rankings. Um, and admissions officers have always had a very love-hate relationship with the rankings. Some schools hate them more than they love them, vice versa. Um, and I think it goes without saying at this point that a lot of people, organizations, even some schools historically have been really invested in the rankings. I mean, have you ever walked through an airport, for example, without seeing some school advertising in the airport, <laughs> you know, rank blah -de blah in U.S. News and World Report? So, you know, it's the system that lots of people and organizations had a stake in. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think if that was ever going to change and if the methodology and the, the prominence of the rankings was ever going to change, I think at least on the law school side, it had to come from Yale Law School, right? Which from the beginning of the law school rankings, I think has always sat at the top. So um, if they really had to be the first mover and I give Dean um, Heather Gherkin so much credit for that uh, because I think if, if Yale wasn't gonna budge, then it would be that much harder for anyone else to budge. Um, so hats off to them. One of the things that I've discovered with applicants is that they don't really necessarily know how that sausage gets made. They don't really look at the methodology. They don't really care. I think that's a pity because applicants, in my opinion, over rely on the rankings. And if and if ultimately your priorities match up 100 percent with the priorities of Robert Morris at U.S. News and World Report. Great. Your work is done. <laughs> Take that shortcut. Um, but do you actually know um, you, the applicant, um, do you actually know? what goes into that methodology. And that's all up in the air right now, right? So I don't think that's been released yet with the new method. We know it's changing for this year in response to all the, the drama. Um, what people might not understand is that participating in the rankings has always been optional for law schools um, to a degree. And what I mean by that is there's some information that always fed into the rankings that was publicly available. A lot of that comes from ABA disclosures. So for a school to maintain its ABA accreditation, it has to make certain information publicly available to the ABA, and you can just Google it, ABA disclosures, insert name of school. Um, and so it's not as if schools had any, had any it never had the option of withholding that information just for rankings purposes. That was always public through the ABA. But the rankings also had components that were not publicly available and that were sort of proprietary to their methodology. Um, most famous, so publicly available would mean things like what are the admission stats? Um, what is the bar passage rate, that kind of information. And then the U.S. News would sort of add its secret sauce, um, for example, in the for form of these peer reviews, where in theory, <laughs> they, would, they would get the opinion of uh, law school professors, practicing lawyers, and judges 
and ask them their opinions of these 200 ABA approved law schools, if you stop and think about it, that's just not possible. How could any one person really have a thoughtful, well-informed opinion about all of those schools that are ABA approved and it's roughly 200? Um, and so things like the, the peer reviews have always been a bit of a controversy, including with the undergrad rankings. That's even more complicated. There are a lot more colleges than there are law schools. So part publicly available, part kind of weird secret sauce. Um, and U.S. News has in response to, well, let me back up. I, I missed a step. Heather Gerken at Yale, first law school to say, you know what, we're not voluntarily participating in this anymore. So all those pieces that are not publicly available, go do, go do your thing with the publicly available information. We can't stop you. But historically, when schools have participated in the rankings, it meant filling out these surveys and adding all this other information for this like secret sauce. So when schools say they're boycotting, it's just that part that they're withholding. They're not going to participate in these hoops that they used to jump through um, where they would report. And it was very time consuming. I mean, I, I had to do them too back in the day. It's, it's, it's a hassle. It's a hassle. And if you get it wrong, it causes problems. You might get punished in the rankings. And sometimes those are innocuous mistakes. Um, some schools play fast and loose and then they get caught. This is in the news constantly at different universities. Um, it's a big hoo-ha, the rankings. So once um, Yale announced it was no longer going to participate in the rankings, then you saw other schools following their lead. Not all of them. Not all of them. And there's still plenty of schools that participate. I think that complicates the validity of the rankings even more because at least before you were working with a data set across all the different schools whether you agreed with the algorithm or the different weights in the algorithm or how they do these peer reviews, whether you thought it was good or not, or reliable or not, uh, at least it was a common data set for all these law schools. Now you have some schools for which they have only the publicly available data. Other schools are still participating and are throwing other stuff into the mix. <sighs> I, you know, and the idea that you can rank 200 law schools in an ordered list. It was so, such a flawed premise to begin with. I think now it's even more complicated by the fact that you don't have a common data set across all the schools that they're purporting to rank. So here we are. Um, and U.S. News had announced that it was going to change up its methodology um, in response to um, this leadership that um, Heather Gerken exercised at Yale. And as you were alluding to before, they were supposed to announce today what that new methodology was going to be. And now they've bought themselves some more time, although they have published already on their website what some of the changes, the anticipated changes would be. We just don't know exactly what the weights are um, and so forth. So, for example, um, they're going to increase the weight of the bar passage rate. That's all publicly available. You can look up the, pub, the bar passage rate for any law school. You don't need U.S. News for that. Um, they're going to significantly increase the weight of employment 10 months after graduation. Okay. Uh, they're no longer going to punish law schools for people who went off and got another graduate degree. They didn't count that as employment before. There's going to be a reduction in the weight of those reputation surveys, the peer reviews, the peer assessments. We don't know by how much. We just don't know yet what the different weights are going to be. But here's the, here's the thing that really sticks with me. Let me pull up the exact language so I'm not paraphrasing here. So this was this came out in the Wall Street Journal recently. Um, at a January presentation to law schools, Robert Morse, um, U.S. News's chief data strategist, disclosed that he didn't commit to a particular mathematical model until after receiving the school's data. And this is according to a Yale Law School professor who was, who was in the room or in the, in the Zoom room. I don't know if it was virtual or not. Um, once that information was in hand, the team at US News ran simulations giving various factors different weights to see the potential outcomes before deciding on a final method. 
that to me, I mean, that's the bottom line right there. They pick the outcome they want and then they figure out what methodology they want. And I just, it, it pains me that law school applicants put so much weight on these rankings that are dodgy. I think it's fair to say they're a bit dodgy. So I think that catches us up to the present. They are going to release the exact methodology soon enough. We just don't have it in hand yet. But I would argue, honestly, that's sort of missing the forest for the trees if we overfocus on the methodology, because I think the whole thing is a, is a bit of a dodgy enterprise to begin with. Well, thank you for the detailed rundown, Anna. I think you made so many spot on points. Uh, I also noticed that uh, what you just quoted from Ian Ayers at, uh, in the Wall Street Journal article. Yes, yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. I should have mentioned it by name. Yeah. No, of course. No, that was, that was a great excerpt there that called out to me as well. I mean, just the idea that they can choose the methodology after seeing the results and they can run 20 different simulations and see which one puts certain schools on top. I mean, one thought that occurred to me is that given how much they have adjusted the methodology this year relative to last year, as you said, increasing bar passage and employment, downplaying admissions stats a little bit, downplaying the reputation scores. If the rankings were to radically shift based on the different methodologies, that would then call into question how the rankings have been conducted for right. the past 30 plus years, however long it's been, right? And does that correlate in any real way with the, the caliber of these schools or even the market value of these schools and the employment market in any real way, um, you know, if a school goes up six points or even drops 20 points, does that reflect anything that happened from one year to the next in the real world? And I'm having trouble imagining that. No, it's certainly not. I mean, I could imagine, you know, the, the, especially then you know, the reputation scores being so circular. Yeah. Because what, how can you know all 200 schools? Well, you think back to how they've been ranked in the past and that informs how you rate their reputation going forward. I, I could imagine that in, you know, maybe for for big law jobs where someone looks at the the name on the resume of their of your law school and seeing, oh well, you went to a prestigious school. That's good enough for me. Like maybe in some limited circumstances that matters in terms of getting a job in certain you know, white shoe law firms. But for all the applicants who are seeking alternative employment in different areas, you know, that may not be the most impactful thing to consider purely based on your reputation, for example. I think that's right. And um what I, what I tell applicants is, look, there is a pool, a small number of law schools that really do have national reach and where location doesn't matter. You know, if you go to Stanford for law school, then it doesn't really matter where that law school is located, right? It has national reach and even in an international brand. Um, you know, we roughly refer to those as the top 14. That's an artificial construct, too. There is nothing magical about 14 versus 15. And it's certainly nothing magical about what US News says, you know, is this on this side of the line versus that side of the line. But roughly speaking, there are kind of 10 to 15 schools with that kind of national reputation and national reach for job purposes. And that can be very important and meaningful to some applicants who want to be on certain tracks professionally. You know, big law tends to recruit from those schools, you know, the fancy government jobs, tend to recruit from those schools. They tend to matter for clerkships, you know, the fancy federal clerkships. So, you know, here on planet Earth, yes, that matters. Um, I would say where the rankings really fall apart. So I think the rankings are fine if you're trying to figure out, okay, what are those like roughly 10 to 15 schools where I have that kind of reach? Not that the rankings tell you that explicitly, but, you know, I think that's a fair indication of who those schools are. Um, once you get outside of that very small number of national law schools, location, I would argue, matters a lot. Now you're dealing with what I would call more regional law schools, where your employment prospects and your recruiting prospects, at least in the short term, are going to be the home turf of that law school. And so that's where conceptually the rankings for me become really useless because you're treating all of these other 180 plus law schools in the country as somehow interchangeable, but for, you know, these, these rankings. But I think region should matter the most. And if you want to use the rankings then to compare schools within a certain region, that might be one way to do it. 
But I've seen applicants really make what I think are some not great decisions about where to apply and then even where to enroll because, well, this school in Florida is ranked higher than this school in New York. I have offers from both. And I say, well, where do you want to practice? Oh, New York. Please don't put that deposit down in Florida. You know, the rankings give people the idea that this ordered list for 200 schools is actually how it works in the real world. And it just, it just doesn't. Um, and I worry that really the rankings are most misleading. Uh, and one could even argue they prey on the people who are least informed about legal education and legal employment and legal careers. And that would be applicants. So I'm always happy for the opportunity to have these conversations in a sort of public forum, um, because I think applicants are the ones who need to hear that message the most. Um, and even among those national law schools, I've seen people make some decisions that make me cock my head. I mean, look, law school applicants, with very few exceptions, are all legal adults. You know, you drive that bus, you do you. Only you get to decide what your priorities are. I respect that. Um, but I want you to have good information too. And I want you to be able to make thoughtful decisions. Um, so when I see someone turning down a really sweet, sweet scholarship from say Columbia to pay full fare at Stanford because they're ranked higher, I have that conversation with them. Um, but the ranking, the pull of those rankings is so strong that I've, I see people routinely turning down, and this is a hypothetical, I think it was a real case at some point, um, turning down that sweet scholarship at Columbia to go to Stanford um, at full price. And as I say, you are the only one as the applicant who gets to decide what your own weighted algorithm is. But if you're basically punting that to U.S. News and World Report to make that algorithm for you, I would say that's not that's not being fair to yourself, honestly, because that's just using the short the, that's using the rankings as the shortcut, not to do your own homework. And I think that's a that's a pity. Agreed. No, it's it's not it's not wise. It's not responsible, as you said. For for an adult, you know, you can't outsource the decision making to a, an external third party, as you said. You know, Robert Morse Robert Morse making his decisions, which can fluctuate in the methodology from year to year. It's not based on what you personally want to do. So. Stanford versus Columbia, you know, it's, it, I was thinking of a, a similar sort of example as well, where th the merit aid for a school ranked a few po places lower. If you could get a full ride and save yourself $150,000 or more to go to, and go to Columbia for free versus Stanford at full fare, you know, it might not make one iota of difference whether you went to Stanford or Columbia in terms of getting a big law job if that's what you want. If that's what you want, you know, and that's where I think it really makes sense to dig in a little bit. Are the and 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 I'm thinking of a scenario, for example, where someone was really interested in becoming a prosecutor. Columbia is not shabby in any way for having produced alums who go off to do really great things as prosecutors. Um, so it's it's as I say, the the pull of the rankings is strong, um, and I think ultimately that is the appeal of the rankings. It just has this veneer of making it all easy. Right. Like they've done the work for you. And so I just think it's important to keep reminding people, like, no, they actually haven't done that work for you. And this might actually have a real impact on your goals, your debt. Um, you know, some people have a money train in the back and they can shake it. And so the price is no issue. God bless. That's not true for most people. Right. Um, anyway, I see that kind of decision making being made all the time. Or here's another example. Someone is just hell bent on going to Yale Law School, even though everything I've learned about them suggests to me that Yale is actually not the best fit for what they want to do. Um, and you have that conversation with them. And it's no Yale, 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 Yale. And then the way I phrase the question, the follow-up question is, if U.S. News weren't ranking, ranking them number one consistently, or even just this year, would it be your number one choice? And when you phrase it that way, they're very honest. They say no. <laughs> and okay, maybe your top priority is collecting shiny, shiny degrees. 
um, as I say, you get to decide what's most important to you, but I would not take that shortcut approach. Um, it's, I get, I get less paternalistic about that or maternalistic about that than when we're talking to high schoolers applying to college, you know, they are kids, they are minors, (laughs) you know, um, but when you're dealing with ostensible grownups, um, I would just say, do the work. The there's also um, there's also the question of I mean the, the factors that have gone into the U.S. news rankings in the past and as being you know, kind of ridiculous. I mean the expenditures per student, mm-hmm. the number of the number of books in the library, yep. the fact that they would in- include those factors for I don't know how long, and then suddenly they've removed those. But then they what are they replacing them with? I mean there's questions right now over the delay related to potentially mm-hmm. them using faulty data, you know, flawed data. They're faulty they're not the data. most they're not the most responsible clearinghouse in general, even if they did use the quote unquote correct factors. That's right. And it's not as if this is regulated in any way. And it's not as if this stuff is audited in some kind of meaningful way. You know, these are not like SEC filings. There are no accountants here. This isn't even the Oscars where they have an accounting firm, <laughs> you know, right. checking the data. Um, no such thing. And so when schools get busted for misrepresenting their data, intentionally or not. Um, It's usually because, I mean, famously in the undergrad rankings, you know, Columbia got busted by one of their own professors. Mm -hmm. I think it was a math professor who just ran some simulations and was like, this can't be right, (laughs) you know? Um, But it's just, it's it's a very loosey goosey system, right? Um, I will say that schools don't help matters. And this is where I think schools can take a little bit of ownership too, which is that, okay, if you're not relying, here I am saying, oh, don't take these shortcuts, you know, do the work. Well, how do you actually do that? Right. So most people would start at the law school website. I mean, can we just state the obvious that these law school websites, university websites are terrible they're terrible. And I know why that is from the admission side. It's because when you're making the website and deciding what to put on there, you have to make about 600 different constituents happy. You have to do it for alums and the media and trustees and the the dean of the school and maybe the provost and blah, 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 blah. And so it ends up being this dog's breakfast. And so what ends up happening too, is if you look at any of the marketing materials from from these law schools, they all look the same. They all look the same. They're all really committed to public interest. They're all super interdisciplinary. It's all the same wugga mugga. And so, you know, I can understand why there's this temptation to be like, okay, I'm going to go to this third party source and they just make it really easy for me. Right. Um, So I think schools could do a better job distinguishing themselves. And the irony is applicants are expected to distinguish themselves. Right. Right. Law schools do a terrible job taking that own medicine, you know. Um, and I remember when I was a very, very new admissions officer and went on my first, you know, went to my first LSAC fairs and you're standing in those giant ballrooms in a Marriott in like Dallas or wherever, and you have hundreds of people coming by and they're going from table to table. They're talking to all the different law schools and they come to you and they're like, so what makes you different? It's a hard question to answer. It's a hard question to answer thoughtfully, whether you're a law school or whether you're an applicant applying, right? Um, so so websites, terrible. I understand that. But you all today are applying in the internet age. When I was in law school or when I was applying to law school, I did not have this advantage because I now sound like I'm 100 years old. But you're in the Internet age. Use LinkedIn. Use your connections. Use, um, you know, your career services from undergrad to connect with alums from your school who have gone on to law school. Go find people. Right. You can connect with people who are current students at those schools. If your budget permits, I would go visit the ones that you're seriously interested in. People have very subjective reactions, even schools that are roughly in this, you know, they're roughly peer schools. You might have a very different reaction just setting foot there and sitting in on a class and wandering around the halls and talking to the students. It does cost money. And that is 
as with so many things in life and as with so many things with law school, the law school application process, it does benefit you if you have that money to spend. I would argue that it is such a small fraction of what you're about to pay for law school. And it's a good investment. Now, it does benefit you to narrow the list. So you're not going to visit 40 schools, I hope, right? Some people wait until they find out where they've been admitted, and then they invest in visiting. Um, it's interesting to me, though, a lot of people applying to college do visit those schools. And it's, and it's, it's also a class issue, obviously. It's for, for a certain part of applicants, it's this rite of passage to go on this college tour with your parents, right? But most, most people don't do that. Most people can't afford that. But for, for people who have the budget and the time and whose parents get that involved, they go on these college tours, right? And they go visit these colleges. Even those people who are in a position to do that for college tours, they don't turn around and do the same thing for law school. And they just don't spend the time or the money to go visit these places. And I find that a really interesting disconnect because there's this kind of con old wisdom, which I don't think is wrong, which is like, it's really the terminal degree that matters. You know, if you're looking for like the shiny name and the shiny degree, it's the terminal degree <laughs> that's going to be, you know, top of the resume. Um, <clears throat> and so if anything, you should be focusing on that term. If law school, if the JD is your terminal degree, and for most people it would be, why aren't you visiting these places if you can afford to do so? I think that's so important. And if, and if you did it for college, why aren't you doing it now? So if you can visit, do that. Obviously, visiting is a hassle. It's expensive. You have to book flights, blah, blah, blah. Well, I guess one of the few good things to come out of the whole lockdown era we've been living in is that schools have been forced to make themselves more available by Zoom. Obviously not the same thing as visiting a law school, but at a minimum, go do that. At a minimum, go do that. And at a minimum, go connect with current students, recent alums. We're in the internet age. Go find them. You know how. But as I say, websites, kind of terrible. I, you know, I get it. They're awful. To go back to uh, so many great points there, um, to go back to the question of alternate sources of data aside from of course US news which is not the reliable clearinghouse they would like to be we have you know other alternatives you mentioned school websites and the problems there what about more third party sources like the ABA 509 disclosures mm -hmm. themselves or if not them then law school transparency for example mm -hmm. to organized as, as a relatively more objective source. I'm glad you name checked them. I mean, they're also looking at a lot of that publicly available data, right? Um, but yeah, and that's why before go Google, you know, ABA disclosures and the name of the law school, and that'll take you right to the disclosures they have to make every year. Um, now, as with any kind of disclosures, and this is true, whether it's a law school or, you know, a publicly traded company, any disclosures that you're making are information from the past, and they don't necessarily predict the future. But I will say this, when there are changes that happen for law schools, whether it's admissions statistics, for example, bar passage rates, employment data, those don't change dramatically overnight. <clears throat> those are slow moving, you know, tankers, basically. Um, so I think the public disclosures are reasonably reliable as far as what is likely to be the case in the coming in the coming season. Does it have every piece of information you could possibly want? No, um, wish it did. Uh, I like also using the, um, at least for admissions purposes, um, trying to figure out what schools should be on your list in terms of the admissions side. I would say use the LSAC calculator where you plug in the GPA in your LSAT and it runs both of those numbers, which I think is important because they do get considered together, not in isolation. Um, and LSAC will run those two data points for you and compare it to the admissions results from the previous cycle. Also not a perfect tool for a number of reasons. Um, not least, those numbers matter a lot, but the search results aren't going to tell you, did this person apply binding early decision or not? You know, what were that person's soft factors? Uh, did they have some kind of VIP connection? Did they have some kind of other 
soft factor that, you know, made them very attractive. No idea. All they're looking at is those two data points, but they are very important and very, and they are reasonably predictive. And when you see the search results for any two, any combination of LSAT and GPA, you know, you can really see the search results moving in lost lockstep as those numbers go up, you know, you see the search result, the, um, the odds go up. So the, the numbers do correlate very, very tightly. Um, where it gets interesting is where you're not like an easy admit or an easy no, and you're in that mushy middle, that's where the soft factors really do come into play. Because by definition, the admissions officers could kind of go either way with your file. So um, I don't want to suggest that those fat soft factors don't matter. Um, they certainly do. Um, but you can use that as a starting point. The bone I have to pick with that calculator is that um, most schools participate the tippy top schools do not. Is that calculator based on the um, disclosed admissions indices for the schools? Do those line <clears throat> up with um, who participates and who does not? Um, that's a good question. Um, to your to your point, you know that 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 data is publicly available through the ABA. I'm not sure if at the moment they also have to submit data independently to to LSAC. But here's the thing: LSAC really has a monopoly on that information. Anyone who applies to an ABA approved law school has to run their GPA and their LSAT scores through LSAC. They don't mm -hmm. need anybody else for that information. They have all that data, right? And in fact, they, yeah. they are the most authoritative source of that data. You don't have to rely on anyone to, to disclose anything. They have the, the primary source information, right? And what bothers me about the calculator and the fact that the tippy top schools don't participate is I think applicants should benefit from more transparency rather than less. Um, and so I think, you know, we could all pretend that the numbers don't matter getting into those tippy top schools, but we know they do. And I think it would be helpful, for example, for an applicant to know, has anyone gotten into Harvard Law School last year with a 158 LSAT? 162? Is it zero? Is it two people? Like, is it a bunch? I mean, I have a reasonable guess at the answer, but I think if schools don't like what the search results would say, that's on them. That's about mm -hmm. their admissions practices if they don't like that, right? If they don't like the optics of it. But to pretend that those things don't actually matter is, I think, misleading. And sometimes you go to the information, as the applicant, you go to the information sessions from those schools and their admissions offices and they'll say things like, well, you can't get in if you don't apply. Well, that is technically true. It can also be super misleading if you're not transparent about the numbers. Right, right. Well, it'll come down to the schools wanting to get as many applicants as possible, as many applications increase their selectivity and give the the happy you know, sounding picture of we are holistic. You are never denied based solely on a number when in reality there is some bar, Right. And that's, you know, and, and I can understand why from the admissions side, they wouldn't like transparency around that. But as I say, that's on you and your admissions practices and your institutional priorities. Why hide that ball from the applicants? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because then you're just giving people false hope, right? Or maybe you're that person who got in with a historically very low LSAT score for them, but you had like a super tight connection that really mattered at a particular school. Okay, great. That's an outlier situation. I would never bank on the outlier situation, but I would say more data is better than less data. And I think it's interesting that it's those top, top schools that, that boycott the LSAC <laughs> calculator. <laughs> They're not just boycotting the rankings. They also boycott the calculator. And the other thing that's a little weird and meta about that is that LSAC itself is just a consortium of the participating schools. Right, right. So it exists to benefit the law schools first and foremost, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So always keep that in mind. Ultimately, their constituents are the law schools, not the applicants, which is why they also do certain things. This is a, veering a little bit off topic, but I think about it a lot, which is um, because you, and this is changing a little bit now that some schools are accepting the GRE, but in a world where mostly it's still dominated by LSAT, um, it's interesting to me that LSAC will make visible to the law schools whether you have so much as registered for an LSAT. And I call BS on that. I think that's 
not defensible. Imagine if on the undergrad side, the common app were the same as the college board. I don't think law schools have any right to know whether you've registered for a test. That's none of their business. And you might register for a test for all kinds of reasons. Why that matters is because some schools will look at that information and say, oh, even though you already have a score and you submitted an application, we're going to put a hold on your application until we see that new score. You might not even take that test again. All you've done is register, right? But it causes all kinds of chaos when they then put a hold on your application. In my opinion, law schools shouldn't even have visibility into that. And they only do because LSAC is both the application platform and also administers the test. I'm amazed that the Department of Justice or the FTC has not gone sniffing around that for antitrust reasons. It's probably a low priority. Anyway, veering off topic, but it is all kind of all connected because I think I think having the information is important, um, but there are all these little sort of things to keep in mind about who they're actually, whom they are actually serving. So in LSAC's case, they're serving the schools, less so you. Fine, that's just how it works, but understand who their actual customers are. They make a lot of money off you, obviously, um, and they make a lot of money selling your data. Um, that's true for any big test prep, um, not test prep, sorry, <laughs> testing company, right, is, is the big revenue driver is selling your data. So that's just the reality, but they're also making money off of the tests you take, um, so they're making money off of you, but ultimately their customers are the schools and not you. That, that's a very good point. And I mean, in a way it's not really the, just as you on the undergrad admission side and your work with applicants there, I mean, the high school kids are not the clients. It's the parents who are the clients. They're the ones making decisions. Similarly, I would think the law schools are the ones deciding to require the LSAT or to prioritize hmm. the LSAT, which then has the ripple effect of causing the applicants to take the LSAT. If law schools were saying, take the GRE, it doesn't matter at all in the slightest, which they don't quite come out and say so directly, then applicants maybe would shift their behaviors and LSAT would get less money, right? Well, it's been interesting to see the undergrad landscape move so heavily over to test optional. Law schools, as you know, haven't had that luxury. The ABA still requires a standardized test doesn't require the LSAT per se, but it does require a standardized test. It's been interesting to watch schools slowly but surely embrace the GRE as an alternative for the LSAT, but um, the numbers I've seen suggest that the LSAT is still the dominant test. I think it will remain that way. And just from our consulting practice, and this is anecdotal, of course, this is not a huge sample size, let alone a complete one. But what we've seen is I, I do believe that people applying just with a GRE score are held to a higher standard than people applying with an LSAT score. Um, I would not treat them as just interchangeable in the process. And um, I'd love to see a bit more transparency from the schools around that too. Yeah, I had a, one conversation with Rob Schwartz at UCLA who said that they accepted fewer than 5%. Of five, fewer than 5% of the applicants they accepted had a, a GRE score. It was really the, you know, indicating the else. And this was already a, a couple of years ago. Maybe it's shifted, but I, I wouldn't think it's shifted very much. Might not be causation, right? I mean, it might be that those tend to be weaker applicants True. in other areas. Uh, we, we don't know. But as I say, I, I think more data helps applicants make smart decisions. Um, a lot of times, look, if, if the ABA didn't require this data, you know, I don't know that schools would offer it up voluntarily. On the college side, on the undergrad side, a lot of the really interesting data you have to pry out of their cold, cold hands in the form of lawsuits. You know, all this really interesting data we have about UNC and Harvard um, and their admissions processes, which a lot of people in higher ed already knew um, anecdotally or from experience, but it was, you know, in terms of the, the actual cold, hard data. That only comes out when they get sued and they're forced to disclose it as part of the discovery process, right? And some of that's um, under FOIA as well, right? For Stanford or, or Berkeley, I mean, look, it? lots of lots of schools are under FOIA mandates. Yeah. <laughs> but over the years, anytime a law school gets sued, they're going to be FOIA requests and they're also going to be um, 
as part of whatever the settlements are, um, they're also required to keep documentation and you don't get to sweep stuff under the carpet once, once that all kicks in. But, you know, just to be clear, you know, it's, it's not the case that schools necessarily would disclose any of this stuff voluntarily. And when they can opt out, as we've seen, some of them do. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, this has been a riveting conversation. We've covered, <laughs> we've covered so much ground here, Anna. Thank you for bringing your it's expertise. It's been so interesting. I'm so, um, I'm so glad that they have your expertise to guide them through the LSAT. That's not something I ever get too involved in. I'm, I'm certainly not an LSAT expert. Um, so I'm glad they have all the, the resources that you make available to help them with that because it does matter. A lot. And, and so um, I, I like to tell people that, you know, if you really want to be in the running with the soft factors, you really should clear that hurdle first. It is of very course, important. Of course. But as you said, also, there's those edge cases where it's a little bit fuzzy what the outcome could be. And then those, that, those cases, the soft factors matter a great deal. And, that, and that's where, where you come in. Yeah, well, by definition, a selective law school means that, you know, they're they're turning away more people than than they accept. And so um, they have the luxury of being picky. That's just supply and demand. Right. And in a world where they can afford to be picky. Yeah, they they really drill down into all those details. Good luck to all your students. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting year. Um, I hope people don't. Um, get too too caught up in whatever the rankings um, turn out to be this year, next year, the year after that, um, especially with the methodology changing. I think that's just sort of exposing kind of the lightness of um, how much you should rely on these things to begin with. So, um, but that doesn't change anything, frankly, in your world. Um, doesn't change much in mine or in the world of the applicants, which is ultimately whom we're all trying to serve. I think the really, really interesting conversation will happen if the ABA does lift the standardized testing rules. So I don't know. Anything could happen. It's always fun to talk to you. I was worried I wouldn't have enough to say about the rankings because I think they're so silly, but it <laughs> turns out, no, we always have something to say. You're fun to talk to. You too know, and in fact, in fact, I think because the rankings are so silly, just pointing out the various ways in which they're flawed gives plenty of fodder here. But as you said, this this news is also, in a way, much ado about nothing because the rankings shouldn't matter a whole lot to applicants, whether it's the old methodology or the new methodology, whatever the reasons may be for the changes. I mean, look, this is absolute catnip for the media. Yeah, <laughs> true. Okay, yeah. you know, fine, but try to. Try to separate that from what actually is important in the process and in your career and your education. Certainly, certainly. Well, Anna, again, thank you again for the great conversation. You're, again, the, the founder of Ivy Consulting, and I assume folks can reach, reach out to you with you know, with questions or looking for support with their, with their applications, right? Yeah, just come to our website, AnnaIvy.com, A-N-N-A. I-V-E-Y.com. Don't, I -V -E -Y, forget, the, don't yes. forget the E. It's actually my last name. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Right, well, thank you again, Anna. Thanks for the great conversation. We'll be in touch. Likewise. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you are still looking for help with your LSAT prep, please feel free to reach out. At LSAT Unplugged, we offer live online classes via Zoom, on-demand video courses, small group coaching, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Check out the links below this video to find out more and to book a call with me and my team We'd love to help you out. And if you are aiming for a score of 170 or above on the LSAT this fall, I'd especially love to hear from you. I'm looking for a couple of students who are dedicated to getting the highest possible LSAT score and meet the following criteria. First off, I'm looking for you to have scored a 160 or above on at least one timed practice test. I'm looking for you to have studied for at least three months and that you've built a strong foundation in the basics of the LSAT the different sections, and the different question types. If you meet these criteria, I would personally love to speak with you. Please check out the links below to book a call with me and my team. We'd love to help you out. Please like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It really helps with that YouTube algorithm, and I really do appreciate it. In the meantime, I wish you all the best, and take care.
Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.